Hi, this is Nick Brubulis. I'm a member of the International Academy of Education. This is another in a series of interviews that we're doing with authors in the booklets of our Educational Practices series. These are short research-based overviews of important contemporary issues in educational policy and practice. Today's guest is Bill Schubert, author of a booklet called Curriculum Matters, What Teachers Should Know and Do. And we're going to talk a little bit about this booklet today. Bill, welcome. It's good to talk with you. Oh, thanks. Glad to talk with you, Nick. Okay, so let's start with the title. What is the role? What do you think the role of teachers should be in creating curriculum and not just implementing the curriculum that someone else decides for them? Well, I think that they have a very special role in being able to uh, focus in on the particular class, the particular students. They know the students. They know the nuances of the situation and so on. And so there are things that uh, those who try to make curricula in advance and distribute those curricula to teachers simply can't realize. And the teachers need to reflect on that. So they need to uh, do some of the hardest uh, thinking and and reflection, uh, both in the course of action and um, in preparation for act uh, about curriculum. Yeah, say a little bit more about the knowledge and experience that teachers bring and how that's relevant to curricular decisions. Well, I think that uh, we all um, engage in curriculum uh, thought about our own lives and so forth. We, um, I, I like to call it when I work with teachers, particularly, I like to uh, call it the theory within. We have an emerging or evolving theory within us that uh, that we um, that we focus on and continue to develop uh, that guides our interactions with the world and the the practice or praxis that we engage in uh, with, uh, with students and with uh, anyone, really. Mm -hmm. So one of the points that you make in your book is that it's important to uh, relate to local communities and parents also in this process of curriculum development. Um, that issue, at least in this country, has a certain resonance today where the impact of these communities and parents is often hostile to the discretion of teachers deciding certain matters of curriculum. And as you know, in the United States, at least, there are actually efforts right now to constrain and limit uh, what teachers can teach in the classroom. How do, in a democratic society where engagement with the public is part of the teacher's responsibility, how does that take place in a context where big sections of the pu public and specific parent groups are often hostile to the goals and aims that teachers have. When I was a teacher uh, in elementary school, prior to becoming a professor in the area of curriculum, uh, it took me a little while, but not too long to realize that when I had par parent-teacher conferences, I could learn a lot from the parents. Mm -hmm. I could learn a lot about the uh, the individual student, what motivates them, uh, what kinds of things they've learned in their, in their life and so on. I think that uh, some of the people who are protesting so much today and, uh, and turning against authority, turning against academe and so forth, thinking that they're the enemy of some sort, um, uh, need to be involved in the process, but they also need to be involved in a way that helps them be able to think more deeply about um, what's worthwhile for uh, uh, human beings uh, to grow and develop in, in the world. And, you know, that, that worthwhile question is one that I like to come back to a lot uh, in working with these. What's worth knowing and doing and being and becoming and overcoming and not just what's worth testing, for instance, but all of those kinds of things. What's worth imagining and just plain wondering and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, all of those kinds of questions are so important. And the parents that I've met and uh, um, are really intrigued by those kinds of questions. I remember uh, as a professor at the University of Illinois Chicago working with uh, the local school councils 
uh, and sometimes the local school council's parent representatives um, had not been to school for very long themselves, but they had ideas and they really wanted to share those ideas. And when I presented a lot of background to them and so forth, they said, well, now we know this, but how about the people in charge of the school system? How about the governor? How about the, uh, <laughs> the secretary of education and so forth? Do they know about these things? Do they know about these choices? And they, they really got into it. I suspect that maybe if we moved a little bit more in that direction than in the direction of simply uh, fighting against their tendency to fight with us, uh, we might be able to uh, move more democratically in the sense of a kind of Dewey and um, participatory democracy. But that requires people have studied to some extent or at least reflected on the different possibilities. Yeah, thank you for that. I want to go back to the testing issue in a minute, but let's take a little side de detour on this issue of this word worthwhile. Because uh, I think you're right that decisions about the curriculum are normative decisions about what's important and what's worthwhile. Not only what's worthwhile to learn, but how those decisions about what's worthwhile to learn really reflect larger judgments and beliefs about what it's worthwhile in, in living a life, what's worthwhile yes. in being a citizen of a, of a, of a, of a society. Can you say more about this notion, this normative notion about what's worthwhile and how we make those kinds of decisions about what does belong in the curriculum and what doesn't? Well, you know, I've heard people say um, that uh, they covered the curriculum. That's a common phrase that's used. Uh, and I like to play with other, um, um, other variations on that. Like, what if we uncover the curriculum? Mm -hmm. What kind of curriculum can we uncover? What can we discover? What can we recover uh, mm -hmm. from the past and so forth? What, um, you know, so um, I, I think that, um, that what we really need to do is to keep that kind of questioning alive uh, among teachers and even among students uh, so that they realize that there's a connection between their own self-education, creating themselves. As Mary Catherine Bateson uh, talked about it, she talked about composing a life. We need to compose our life, and we and we don't compose it all all at once. Uh, in fact, we never uh, finish com <laughs> composing our life. I liked uh, Maxine Green's uh, statement. At at one point, she was about uh, in her in her late eighties and walking across a street and said to the interviewer, um, uh, "I am not yet. You know, I'm continually creating myself." And so, to let students, parents, community members, to help them realize that what uh, that that curriculum is the pursuit of what's worth while or what's worth doing and being and becoming uh, is a lifelong process. And how do we address that? How should we address that? It is definitely a normative question, as you say. And it's a normative question that is is profound and requires drawing upon all the all the disciplines and areas of study and personal insights and community insights that uh, um, they at our disposal. Yeah, okay. So let's 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 loop back now to a previous topic, which is because these judgments, and I think you lay it out quite clearly, are normative judgments about what's worthwhile, there are going to be disagreements about what's worthwhile. There's going to be differences in substance, certainly differences in priorities of what's most important and what's less important. Uh, how do we actually adjudicate those create those disagreements about what's worthwhile? in the context of curriculum in a democratic society. You argue clearly in the book that the teachers should be more involved, but I don't think that you're saying that teachers are the only people who should be no. involved in making no. these decisions. But once you open it up, then there's gonna be disagreements. How do we adjudicate those? We need to ask uh, questions about who, in whatever kind of uh, 
particular issue we're, we're, we're addressing or thinking about, we need to ask questions um, about who, who can be the most resourceful for us on this particular kind of question. So we have to have a kind of shifting authority, some things the parents know the most about, uh, you know, some issues. Some issues, other community members or leaders, of, you know, in the government or business community, perhaps even, or um, uh, people in academe, uh, professors of a certain area or other, um, will help us be able to understand uh, these questions. But it's a, uh, the real key is to, to figure out who knows about these kinds of things. And then to realize that the learning, uh, the learning and growing is in the, in the struggle, in the debate, in the sharing of different viewpoints and positions. And it's not a finalized, say, distribution of knowledge to the to the students all hard and fast and ready to eat up it's uh it, it, it's 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 the process of of that engagement of that debate that discussion that enriches us mm -hmm. and can enrich us but we need to kind of try to communicate the idea that that enrichment um is is possible and to at least let it let it happen. Yeah, thank you for that. So you brought the topic of testing. I wanted to come back to this. Uh, we live in a time in which in many schools, uh, in many contexts, uh, test content drives the curriculum content or determines what the curriculum content will be. Uh, that's clearly not your model. Um, how did we get into this situation and what can we do about changing it? Well, uh, one one way to think about it is I, I talk with uh, educators sometimes about uh, formative and summative evaluation. And formative evaluation is, it, uh, well, a summative evaluation is is uh, where we're headed, where we say we're headed. Formative evaluation is whether we're heading there or not, whether we're keeping on track, different kinds of approaches to tell whether we're keeping on track. However, another interpretation of formative evaluation I've derived from Vildovsky and Pressman and Dewey before that, um, where they talk about um, formative evaluation or implementation being uh, the process of asking whether the track is good mm -hmm. and whether or not we need to revise the track in the process uh, as we're going. And um, and I think that that's often the case, that that's, that that's true. And I think a lot of the people who have criticized the, um, um, the testing mania um, I move in that direction. There is actually a joke, if we have time for a joke, that John Dewey told. You know that joke? Joke. Yes, okay. Uh, and, and Dewey uh, didn't tell too many jokes, uh, but but uh, he uh, during the uh, testing movement, which is IQ testing mostly at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, he said he liked to compare the testing movement um, uh, with the way that they weigh hogs in Vermont. And he said the way they weigh hogs in Vermont is they catch a hog and they tie it to one end of a board. They put the board over a fence, kind of halfway over a fence, and bring back rocks until they have found a rock that equally balances with the hog. And then they guess the weight of the rock. <laughs> and he said that's construct validity. Uh, yeah. You know, what do we mean by intelligence? Do the things that are called intelligence tests really test the construct of intelligence that we want to live by. Same thing on achievement, uh, achievement tests. Is that what we want them to achieve? Uh, what about all those other things about uh, worth living and being and becoming and overcoming and things like that? And just wondering, all those are not tested on, on the conventional tests we have. So we have to be very careful about uh, not putting too much emphasis on testing and we're not very careful about it. Yeah, I, I think it was Bridgman who said uh, IQ is defined as that thing which IQ tests measure. 
So kind of similar to yeah. Dewey's point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, you, you also talk about technology in this book, and uh, um, some people might be surprised that there's a discussion of technology in a curriculum book. Today, when people talk about technology, you know this is a particular interest of mine, they tend to talk about technology on the instructional side, computers and tech digital technologies as a means of teaching uh, or a tool for teaching. And certainly there's many ways in which new technologies are, are revolutionizing some aspects of instruction. But uh, in a book on curriculum, it's natural to ask, what impact do you think technology has on curriculum and on content issues? and not just on the instructional side? Well, um, one way to uh, think about it is the curriculum uh, is multi multifaceted. It's, um, it, I, call it the, I call it the outside curriculum, the out of school curriculum. And uh, the curriculum of peer groups and, and uh, families and uh, out of school ma mass media and social media and so forth, they all need to be studied. Uh, the influences of all those and many more things need to be studied uh, as curricula that influence the students come into our schools. And to understand the students, we have to understand the curriculum that are, that, that are shaping their lives and shaping their viewpoints, the theories within them and so on. And if we don't know about that, how can we purport to teach them, um, you know, something that's worthwhile for them uh, if we don't even know what's going on in their reflectiveness yeah. and their actions? Yeah, those are the very, the very thought-provoking questions. Um, Bill, I think we've come to our time. Is there anything else you want to add about the book that we haven't talked about? There's obviously much more in the book than we can get to, and the real point is to get people to click on the link to read the book in itself. It's not long, uh, but there's a lot of rich content in there. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I just uh, reiterate the title that curriculum matters. And in order to understand how much it matters, we need to know about a lot of the things that ought to be included in curriculum matters, <laughs> <laughs> taken in the other sense uh, of the term. And I, uh, I do think that we need to try to connect uh, what students are striving to do in their own life. They really are striving in, their, in many different ways to create who they are becoming. Mm -hmm. And if they can see a connection between what schools offer about that and what they're striving for, I think we're in a much better position to be able to reach them. And the same would be true of their parents, the surrounding communities and so forth. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, overly uh, optimistic about some of those things. And sometimes I get depressed about them, but, um, but what else uh, can you do but to hope for um, movement in that direction? Uh, uh, very much so. Let's, let's end on that hopeful note. Bill, thank you so much for setting aside the time to talk with us. Uh, we do want to urge people to click on the link and read the booklet. Uh, there's a lot there, and you've really done made a, really a major contribution, and we appreciate it. Thanks so much, Nick. I enjoyed talking with you. Take care.